So, David, first of all, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute, which you know well because you are a member of our International Advisory Council. And um, in particular, uh, thank you for agreeing to bring us up to date on what's going on with, with tourism in general in, in uh, Scotland and the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo, uh, of which, of course, your chief executive and director, producer, and um, give us your thoughts on really uh, what the factors were perhaps initially that led to the decision to cancel these things and then what you see is going to happen going forward and then we'll have some other questions for you as well i know doug has so over to you david and thank you no what a pleasure roddy thank you so much and i probably you never ever start with an apology or caveat but i'll i may break that rule at the outset um, as you probably know, I'm due to hand over to Major General Buster Howes on the 13th of June. Um, and our handover sort of starts a couple of weeks before that. Um, last August, um, we agreed with the board that I would head off at the end of this year. And we've had two recruitments, one, in, one for the, the chief executive and the second one for a creative director, which has been, both competitions have been amazing. And chief executive is, is now complete, Buster's going to come into the chair and the creative director is still ongoing and we've got some extraordinary beasts from all over the world people who are sort of used to running olympic games and goodness knows what are in the creative director space so um i must put a caveat on if i may very gently in that i can't i can't pronounce forward of the 13th of june i can make a sort of i hope a reasonably intelligent judgment as to what might lie ahead um, the tattoo, as you know, Roddy, so well, has, has been running now this its 70th year, an anniversary year. It's going to be just utterly splendid. Um, the platinum edition, we were going to call it, and liquid platinum was going to flow over the battlements of Edinburgh Castle and, and down the Esplanade. And we were going to be able to dip into all of the archives, but also just deliver a wonderful international show. Um, all of the, that, of course, along with just about everybody else's plans, are now lying in a skip somewhere, courtesy of, of COVID. Um, a large proportion of our staff are now dispersed at their various homes across Scotland, some are furloughed, and we're now reflecting on the first cancellation of not just a show, but the whole season. We've never cancelled the show for weather or famine or anything else, um, and we've had to cancel this year. That, that's really been huge for us. Um, and because events are expensive as they are it's involved us in about 5.6 million pounds of loss in this year um well buttressed by the company well you know we're well established with reserves and so forth against black swan drama of which this has absolutely turned out to be but it's it's stopped everybody in their tracks and we along with the rest of the events and festivals business hospitality largely and almost every tourism in the world has just stopped absolutely dead from a period of, of tremendous balanced work, great growth and so forth. So that's really where we sit. We're nice and balanced, ready to go for next year and, and stuff in between. But a bit of a, uh, it's been a bit of a, a hard stop um, over the last few weeks. Perhaps I, perhaps I could ask you the, the sort of the, the sort of the critical path that led to the decision to, to cancel until next year, because <clears throat> we read in the newspapers that there have actually been uh, pandemics much worse than this. Um, and during the lifetime, actually, of the, of the festival, I would think, Johnny Nearly and the Tattoo. Um, and there are people saying that everybody's overreacted. And in fact, that the the mortality rate is is not as significant as the people are making out and perhaps the the real concern is the transferability of this virus but that there must people must have thought long and hard about whether to cancel or whether to go on can you can you chat about that a bit yes of course and you'd expect um a, a business like the tattoo and were four companies um all nesting under a charity so each one of them with a really grown-up board and so our horizon scanning is, is reasonably sophisticated um, and our risk management is pretty sophisticated and our sort of innovation is, is quite sophisticated. And we try to look three to four years out 
and try to spot trends anyway, just as part of our sort of normal business. And we've done a number of exercises um, on unexpected events and, and things do happen to, to shut shows. The ash cloud a few years ago, the financial crisis, and as you say, there have been sort of pandemics of one sort or another. COVID didn't look different terribly, um, you know, as we turned the year. And although it was sort of out there and we knew what it was, um, I must admit that as a business, we did not see it coming in as fast as it did. And I think we're, we're not alone in that. I think an awful lot of people, I think, were surprised with, with the speed at which governments responded to it. Um, and one's insurance, of course, insures you against things that you can quantify, that you can see. And many people, for example, will, will have insured against named pandemics. But in the early stages, COVID was not named. So many people will not necessarily enjoy insurance cover and we're, we're amongst those. So when it was clear that um, the, the pandemic was announced and it was picking up pace, there clearly was a, a, a growing probability that events in, in Britain, in Scotland, in Edinburgh would, would be disrupted. And we did, as you'd expect military people to do, we worked out our decision points of where we needed to make a decision. We didn't want to make a decision ahead of when we absolutely needed to. And for us, the two big investment points are building the stands or the contract to build the stands in Edinburgh, uh, on, in front of Edinburgh Castle, and the big accommodation contract for the cast of, you know, best part of 1,200 people in Edinburgh. And when you add up those two, that comes to about 3.3 million. So we didn't want to pass that decision point if there was any significant probability that the show would, would, would be cancelled either because there was a public health drama or indeed, you know, governments moved to mitigate some sort of pandemic, which is, of course, exactly what ultimately happened. So we went to our board in, in mid-March, took their view on those probabilities, presented our case and effectively sought the authority to cancel if um, those things matured, which, which they did. Um, it was then an issue for us, of course, is that the tattoo does not operate in a vacuum. Um, it has many, many people that um, rely on it for their success each year in tourism. Um, we are told that we deliver about uh, 70 odd million pounds into the economy. So there's all of our staff, there was all our customers, of course, about 146,000 people had bought tickets at, at that stage out of a total number of 220,000. Um, there's the city of Edinburgh, of course, um, whose infrastructure and, and many, many businesses hang on it. Our colleagues in Festivals Edinburgh, Scottish government interested, of course, as was the UK government, and then all of the countries that were due to, to show with us this year. And we had to af effectively have a conversation with all of them to try and make sure that when we made an announcement, that would, the announcement would, would remain sensibly controlled. So the communication plan, very much part of that. For us, the key thing was our customers, of course. And, um, you know, many will have bought tickets. And we were very, very keen that when we made the announcement, it was terribly clear as to whether people would get an automatic refund, whether they could um, transfer their tickets to 2021, or they could simply make a, a donation to the charity. And with all those plans made, sitting ready, we then just paused um, to allow the other Edinburgh festivals that show in August uh, to align. And then we all announced together uh, on the 1st of April. And that announcement went for me um, as well as it reasonably could. Uh, we had a couple of customers concerned, obviously, about refunds, travel businesses who rely on us, um, but, but generally pretty good. After that, we had to completely re-engineer our ticketing system which is designed to sell a ticket not give it back yeah and that was technically quite demanding and at the same time of course we're all placed in lockdown so our telephone answering system in coburn street which is a super telephone system um, wasn't geared to queue the box office in 15 flats scattered across the central belt of scotland yeah, of course yeah so we had to put a new phone system in in two days which amazingly the team managed to do 
And in fact, this week, the refunds both to, to individuals and the travel trade across the world it is being actioned. So that's all gone pretty well. I, I talked with Fran Heggie, who of course you will know very well, yes. as the Executive Director of the Edinburgh International Festival. And they, I think, are going to, well, not only have they, have they retained the performers for next year and promised them that they can appear again, but I guess they have a lot of archives that they can show again um, during the dates, between the dates when the festival would have been running. And so they can run a sort of virtual from the archives, Edinburgh International Festival. The tattoo is rather different, isn't it, in some ways? Yeah, it, it sort of is. So we've, um, our creativity is, is designed around the, the, the platinum year, our 70th birthday. Yeah. And whilst some of the material will transfer inevitably for next year, we've, we've had some wonderful music um, arranged and written for this year and I really wouldn't want to sort of lose that um, but you're right at the BBC of course have got archives um, and we I hope will show something over the course of the summer it's an appointment to view the tattoo broadcast in August normally on the bank holiday Monday and we get astonishing numbers of people um, dialing in normally our, our television sits over four million on that afternoon which is mm. tremendous and about a sort of 80 percent um you know people enjoy that it's got a tremendous loyalty to it so we are going to try and dip into the archives i think there are opportunities to to do other things of course we've all learned a lot about how the digital space can be used it yeah. hasn't quite got the same feel to it you can't um unless you're very clever as a producer you can't make the hairs stand up on the neck in quite no. a, a, a sort of live performance of scale but um, there is quite a lot of social media going on at the moment. We're having a tremendous emphasis on talking to our customers, to our network, to our stakeholders, our partners, all over the world. And a very significant number of, of customers have flicked across the transfer to 2021. So over 23,000 have opted to do that, which is just... Really? Yeah. Um, and a lot of international acts have said they'd like to come with us again next year. Um, two of the armed services have signed up, so I'm sort of very happy on that. And in, in the pattern for the tattoo, we've now got a sort of unprecedented number of people wanting to come to Edinburgh before. So for us now, it is about um, ensuring that we remain in people's minds. If you're an event once a year, you, you have to deliberately stay in their mind if you miss a year. Otherwise, you're, you're out of market for a whole, well, nearly 18 months. But it's fantastic to have three shows sold for a show that isn't even, you know, it's 18 months away. Um, all of that, I think, is, is going to be extraordinary because we have now, from a moment when the tattoo was really growing and was at a super pace, looking at America, looking at abroad, looking at, at Canada and so forth, or where we might go overseas, we're now going to have to consolidate to use the operational pause that we're now facing to, to good effect, to dial back on yeah. us, look yeah. after our people, and then really try and regrow um, customers' trust in public events. And that's not going to be uniquely a tattoo challenge. Now, of course, most of us will become momentarily uneasy if we find ourselves in groups of more than, than two or three. So people's yeah. trust of coming together is going to need to be regrown. It's, I think a function of organization, I think it's a function of, of what people get used to, but I think now all events are going to have to integrate public health in a way that they didn't previously. They'll look after fire and safety and security and have you got your ticket and all those sort of normal things. Now public health, that's got to be overlaid and integrated and that brings with it not insuperable problems, but it does have the challenge that if social distancing is to take place in the venues, then your venues will not be full. And those venues will A, not be as profitable as they were before, but also the atmosphere will be very different. So we're placing a considerable emphasis on the sort of measures that we might, for those people that want to go out, whether it's to a club, a pub, a restaurant, a football game, a theater, a live event like ourselves, finding measures that allows those, those people to turn up and, and know they're A, not endangering their own health, but B, they're not endangering other people's. 
and that is going to require real imagination. Um, I'm quite struck by the fact that um, as people think about inoculations and immunity and so forth, those things will be recorded. Of course, there's a huge challenge in that for people is that personal liberty, which is so precious to everybody, I, I suspect we will all find ourselves giving up a little bit of personal liberty if we want to be clear about our health. I, I can't sort of see how we could really operate so well without some sort of tracker, without some sort of passport that says to somebody on the door, I don't have, you know, the virus, I'm able to come in and, and, and be safe for myself and for others. So that's a big, big challenge. Technology, of course, is, is there to help us. Britain's got some amazing um, technologies that are available and people are now starting to really explore those. Um, and I suspect events where they can cost effectively are going to have to have really quite sophisticated um, screening as people come in. And that's all yeah. part of our normal business mm. for security, but I think it's got to have that health overlay as well. That's everybody's problem now, and, yeah. and from small businesses up to, up to large. David, yes, well, thank you. And it's pulling victory from the jaws of defeat. And I know that your, your successors will have to tackle that. But what you're saying is interesting. Chance to sell tattoo masks, I guess. Um, <laughs> yes, funny you should say that. We have a very snappy line. Very in, good. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, the, the role in remunerative tattoo impacts so many other aspects of tourism. And I wondered if, uh, Doug, you'd like to ask David some questions now. Well, thank you, Roddy. Uh, David, perhaps just picking up on your last point, I mean, I understand how you intend to sort of address the public health issues to continue to entice an audience. And um, amazing, I think, that you've got an audience that have off offered to carry their tickets through to the following following year. But I just wondered whether you're really concerned, uh, you know, from a tattoo perspective and indeed from an events and festivals perspective in, in Edinburgh uh, about whether behaviours are going to change as a result of COVID substantially and that will impact on their willingness to attend these large gatherings and to travel and, and things like that in the future? Yes, I think, I mean, of course, everybody's asking this question. Um, as we've all been locked down, we've got very close to our nearest and dearest if we've been lucky enough to share a house with others. If we've been on our own, um, that I'm sure has been a, just a considerable stress. And I think Brilliant as the technology is, it does not allow human beings interaction with other human beings. And I think we all, I think we are a herd animal. I think we crave human contact. Young draw strength from old and vice versa. And I think, um, you know, lots of people say, oh, well, the workplace will change, um, you know, significantly. I, I suspect that we will still crave coming together in ways in the future. It may take us a little while to develop the mechanisms to do that. Um, and, and if you do travel out, of course, of, of lockdown, you're, you're quite struck by how empty everything is as you move about to try and do those things. So I think habits will change. I think they will come back. And I think it's up to those of us that have um, a role in public infrastructure, in public policy, I think this is a very nuanced business. I don't think this is a tap that is either on or off. I, I think we're going to have to be much more thoughtful about how we come together, how, you know, if we do get flu, for instance, do we take the responsible decision that we don't go out in the future because we're not absolutely sure? And I think that will alter. Um, will people travel? I think they will. But of course, naturally, people will not want to go too far from home. That slightly suggests that something like the tattoo will look more towards a domestic, a staycation market than it would internationally. And, you know, in years past, anything like 40% of the, of the, of the tattoo's audience has come in from abroad. I, I think it's up to the country to come to terms with this. I think we should be looking for things to amuse ourselves and distract ourselves around Britain. I, I hope very much that everybody takes a sort of integrated view of it. Um, the habit at the moment is, of course, everyone's terribly antagonistic. And, and you watch, you know, social media, there's a staggering amount of just general grumpiness going on. And, and if we are to get out of this in a sensible way, we're going to have to be imaginative, we're going to have to be creative, we're going to have to be optimistic, and we're going to have to share a little bit of courage as, as well in all of this. I think if we can do that, I think, you know, our own islands have got some amazing things to offer. 
they're on our doorstep. And I think if nationally we can prove that people can move about country without the dreadful R number climbing, and we can be sensible and we don't mob certain bases, we just be a bit more nuanced about how we approach it. I think then when the domestic market has, has felt like settled in whatever is the next normal, then I think international travellers will get, you know, Britain sort of got that right. And, and then our wonderful tourism industry, our wonderful hospitality, wonderful events and festivals and so forth, and our sport, these things which are so integral to our culture can restart. But we all face almost exactly the same problem. Unless you're lucky enough to run a business where you can genuinely deal with a thing from the screen, most of us want human contact. And the real trick now is, is recovering the mechanisms to do that. And I hope that to do as you'd expect me to do, we'll take a, you know, a leadership role in this, whether it's helping to develop the systems in, in conversation with, with the city of Edinburgh, with the, with the Scottish government, with the UK government, um, and, and taking a little bit of a lead on it, because I think, you know, a big event like ours has a very important role. If we get it right, lots and lots of people will say, well, okay, that couldn't be that difficult. So let's let's try it in our own way, and and we're all interconnected. So if we make a success, a taxi driver will get more fares, a restaurant will get more fares, a hotel will be able to restart, and all those other bits. Tourism is so important to us, and in it in it will normally it's one of the sort of most agile parts of an economy. But it's going to be tough, I think, for everyone in those sectors at this time. Um, and and I think the events and festivals sector will will tend to be one of the the last sectors. To, to come out and we're, we're worried about our supply chains. There are a lot of people who are, you know, um, employ themselves. And, and I think that's really tough. And I, what I don't know yet is when we start pulling the throttles forward, whether our bus companies, our caterers, all the other myriad people who are going to the two, I, I hope they're all, you know, alive and well, both financially and physically. Um, there's a lot, lot of work to be done. I mean, perhaps, perhaps linked to that, David, uh, I mean, I recognise that the tattoo has obviously been around for a long period of time and it's established itself as, as a, a very strong business and, and, and it's got a, it, it's looked to maintaining that for the long term. But, but clearly, I'm, I'm, perhaps some of the other festivals and events don't have that luxury. And, and do you feel that there's a risk that some of those will struggle in, 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 in the current climate, particularly if if perhaps Scottish government funding is, is perhaps less available in the future? I, I think it, it's going to be very tough. There's no question about this. And every single business in the country is looking to shorten its horns, to, to find efficiencies, to look after its people, to stay in market and, and be a the future. Those things are standard for all of us. Um, there are, we've been, no, we haven't been, we've been both lucky and we've been prudent. We, we spent a very long time um, trying to develop reserves that will enable us. You'd expect as military people, we always like to have something that we can either exploit success or we can deal when we have, you know, we can deal with whatever comes upon us unexpectedly. So we, we're, we feel very fortunate in, in that, but even the most well-founded reserves do not protect you against this scale of challenge. And I think for, for governments, there's going to be a really big challenge now of how much support financially you can put into almost every part of the, set, of, of the economy. At what point do you have to say, you must now swim or do it? I think that's a really tough call. I think tourism and the events and festivals uh, sector and hospitality, I believe that they have the capacity to recover really quite quickly. They're very agile businesses, most of them, and they're full of very agile, very able and very energetic people. And I, and I hope that we can support those sectors and the cultural sector as well. I hope we can until there is enough, until the conditions are permissive enough for them to restart. But I do think that governments have got some really difficult conundrums ahead of them. And, and these things are often painted as quite binary, either white or black. And I think I said at the beginning, I, I think there's a whole range of nuanced solutions, which I think all governments, whether it's local, whether it's regional, whether it's, you know, Scottish government, UK government, and indeed our international partners, everyone's got some got the best brains in the world working on how do you put money into the economy so that you keep the pump primed. And then when you do turn the throttles, it's got enough fuel 
you know, to, to make it. So that slightly suggests to me that anything that is suppressing business growth needs to be looked at really carefully. And I rather glibly describe, you know, there's all sorts of things that do inhibit growth in business. Uh, I'm not an economist, but I would love to see everyone looking really acutely at anti-growth factors and seeing which of those might be compromised, excepting that, of course, those anti-growth factors, on the other hand, are there to support taxation and support the economy, which, of course, may be supporting people who are less fortunate than we are. As we know, David, uh, Bill Gates was, was predicting some sort of pandemic back in 2015 and saying that this was a threat greater in some ways than, than a nuclear one. And, and as we know, but not for this conversation today, the, the military application of germ-related warfare, of course, is terrifying. And, and we used to train for that. But one ship releasing stuff just as it travels down the channel could, could create chaos. Um, but what you were talking about, the resilience of, of events, um, is interesting, of course, because they had to cancel the Olympics. And although the Royal Edinburgh Military II is a, is a very significant and large affair, the impact of the cancellation of the Olympics... Uh, in, in international. Uh, yeah. Well, we're really grateful to you for, for chatting. A lot of people will be following this around the world when we push it out there. And there are a lot of governments and institutions in Asia and elsewhere who are worrying about how to bounce back and will take a lot of comfort um, from your comments about the need to be sensible, reflect on what does and doesn't work and start preparing for the future. Um, because people, as you say, like to get together. They are creative human beings. And um, as you say, not only with the tattoo, but in major sporting events, all the arena are, are designed for people to fill those seats and sit closely together to watch a spectacle. And um, unless it's you're filming a, a ping pong match or snooker perhaps, or, or, or Wimbledon with no spectators, it's going to be quite difficult. And um, I think Roddy is as well, if I just offer, I think there's one trend which does cause me anxiety and that is that we become very reliant on a global economy. And I think inevitably something like this is going to cause people to look inwards and, and I think that looking outwards is going to become an absolute priority and diplomacy and cultural diplomacy which everybody we all take a part in that I think that is going to be the, perhaps the most difficult thing if we all do become a bit introspective that could sabotage us quite quickly so I, the Asia Scotland Institute has got such an important role in, in keeping these links open yeah well thank you and the uh the current trade war between the United States of America and China is not helpful. And comments about withdrawing uh, support for the World Health Organization, those are not helpful either. And so this is a time for everybody to, to pull together. And you're a, a great example of an organization that does that. And uh, we wish you well in the future, David, and <laughs> hard act to follow. And um, thank you for having introduced us to Doug, who's doing a fantastic job for us as our Institute Director. Yeah. Well, bless you, Roddy. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything the Institute's done for me and for the tattoo. Just greatly appreciated. Stay safe, stay well. Doug, thank you very much too. David, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. All right, brilliant. Bye-bye then. Bye.